So you remember in the class uh, yesterday, um, we talked about um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices. Okay, and I showed you, you know, a few examples of how to work with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, and, um, and a few general principles to notice. Okay, so what I want to do today is to show you um, how the same principles apply to Hermitian operators um, and uh, that the same kinds of principles about eigenvalues and eigenvectors, yeah, they also work. Okay, so let's, let's think about that. Okay, so I want to consider any um, Hermitian operator and like the textbook, um, I'll just call it uh, Q hat, all right? And so that could mean um, energy, could be the Hamiltonian, or it could be the position operator, or it could be the momentum operator, or other stuff that we'll get to later on in the semester. And um, it's Hermitian, meaning that it is equal to its uh, Hermitian conjugate, which is Q dagger that we talked about. Okay, and now the idea is that we can sometimes have an eigenvalue equation. Um, and the eigenvalue equation says that if this operator acts on a function, it gives you just uh, a number, a scalar, times that function. So this um, looks just like the eigenvalue equation for a, a matrix acting on a vector, giving you a scalar times that vector. Um, and so here, if we want to label the things, say this is the operator, this little q is the eigenvalue, and this psi is the eigenvector. That is, if we want to think of it as a vector in Hilbert space. Um, or for an alternative language, we could call it an eigenfunction. Uh, or we could call it an eigenstate. Um, these, these three words all mean about the same thing. Um, and so in quantum mechanics, we stick the prefix eigen on just about anything that is related to this eigenvalue equation. Okay? And so um, if we think of psi as a vector in Hilbert space, we call it an eigenvector. If we think of it as a function of x and time, we call it this an eigenfunction. If we think of it as a, a possible quantum state of the system, we call it an eigenstate. Those, those are synonyms. Um, okay, so uh, we have this nice relationship. Um, and um, you uh, remember that um, this um, eigenvalue equation is equivalent to saying that um, the, uh, the observable corresponding to Q, so the, the observable Q um, has a specific value, little Q 
in the state side uh, with no uncertainty. Right, and that's how we that's how we derived this eigenvalue equation. So we were searching for a situation where there'd be no uncertainty. And this is the necessary condition in order to have no uncertainty. That was we have this eigenvalue relationship. Okay, so um, the point of what I am trying to show you today is that um, all the principles that we talked about yesterday for matrices, they all work here. So let's um, remember what those general principles are. Okay, so for the general principles, um, I had five of them. Okay, so um, one of them is that the um, number of eigenvalues equals the dimension of the vector space. So for a two by two matrix, that's two. For a three by three matrix, that's three, okay? Here we have a Hilbert space, which is infinite dimensional, okay? And so this dimension of the vector space, so Hilbert space, uh, is going to be infinity. Okay, so there's an infinite number of eigenvalues. Okay, so this is you know, one difference between working with Hermitian operators versus with two by two or three by three matrices, right? You're not just gonna find two or three eigenvalues, there's an infinite set of eigenvalues. And um, as a uh, vocabulary word, the set of all eigenvalues uh, is called the spectrum of Q. And that is for reasons you know, related to the energy eigenvalues in a hydrogen atom, which we'll talk about later in the semester. Um, so it's, it's related to what people observe in a spectrum of um, you know, colors of light coming from a prism. Uh, okay, so, um, but this, the set of all eigenvalues, we call it the spectrum. And so, you know, there's an infinite number of eigenvalues in that set. And so um, this is like the set of energy eigenvalues that we found for the particle in a box or for the harmonic oscillator. Right? There's a set of energies, which are the special energies associated with that problem. Um, and so not, not all energies in the world are in that set, right? But there's a, it's a limited set, but it's, it's infinite. There's an infinite number of things in that set. Um, okay, what else? Um, there's another uh, general principle that the eigenvalues are real. Um, and you know, this is important because if we have an observable uh, quantity like energy or position or momentum, and um, we think that a particular state has a specific value of that observable, um, it ought to be a real number, right? It better not be a complex number. You know, an electron is not at, um, you know, position X equals, you know, two plus three I. Um, and so um, it, it better be a real number. Um, so I can, I can show you uh, a, a little proof of that. Um, Let's see, okay, so um, if we have the relationship here, if we have the relationship that Q 
f is equal to q little q f right so f is some some state function um then um we can take an inner product like f with q acting on f and that is the same as the inner product of f with little q times f. Okay. So that is the integral of f star of x times q f of x dx. And this uh, is just equal to, um, let's factor out the q, the little q, and we have this inner product. F is normalized, so that's just a little q, all right? But since q is a Hermitian operator, um, we know that this is equal to what happens if the Q goes on the other side of the inner product. So the Q operator acting on F, you know, the inner product of that with F. Okay, so that is, say, Q F, little Q F, uh, inner product with F. So that is an integral of little q times f of x, all complex conjugate times f of x dx. Okay, and now um, this thing, the complex conjugate of the product q times f, is the complex conjugate of Q times the complex conjugate of F. Okay, so we can factor out the complex conjugate of Q. So that's Q star times this integral of F star of X, F of X, DX. So that's equal to Q star. Okay, so this whole argument proves that this Q is equal to the complex conjugate of Q, okay? So since Q is equal to, little Q is equal to the complex conjugate of little Q, uh, that means it is real. Um, so, so that's consistent also, right? With what we found for eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix. Okay. Now, what about the other principles? All right, well, let's see. There was one that said, um, you can multiply an eigenvector by a scalar and then it, it is still an eigenvector uh, with the same eigenvalue. So uh, let's let's check that. Okay. So if we have this relationship, uh, uh, Q acting on um, acting on the state f is equal to little q times the state f, okay? Then instead of um, f, let's put in f times any scalar. So q acting on um, cf, right? Where c is some scalar, real or complex. Okay. Well, um, because Q is a linear operator, we can just factor out 
that scalar. So that is C times QF, which is C times little q times f. And now c and little q are two scalars, which are just multiplied. And you know, when you're multiplying two scalars, that commutes, right? There's no question about the order in which they go. So that's equal to Q times C times F, which is equal to little Q times uh, CF. Okay, so this now is the eigenvalue relationship for CF. All right, so Q at big Q acting on CF is equal to little q times c. Okay. That's what I wanted to show, right? That uh, if f is an eigenvector, then cf is also an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue uh, uh, q, little q. Okay, and so um, because of that, we can say, uh, therefore, um, you can um, normalize any eigenvector f. Okay, so um, whatever we calculate for the eigenvectors using you know, the same kinds of methods we did earlier in the semester, um, you know, we'll get some eigenvectors aka eigenfunctions or eigenstates, um, which might not be normalized. No problem. We can just normalize them the same way as we've been doing this semester. All right? And so that means multiplying them by a scalar and um, fine, it's still, still an eigenfunction, uh, eigenstate, eigenvector uh, with the same eigenvalue. Um, okay, that's a good principle. Um, another principle, let's say number four is um, number four. What, what was number four? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that eigenvectors corresponding to uh, different eigenvalues uh, are orthogonal. Um, yes, so this is also true. And um, I can give you a little uh, mini proof of that one also. Okay, so the proof is like this, okay? So suppose we have um, a couple of um, different eigenvalues and different eigenvectors of uh, an operator, okay? So here it's an operator acting on F is little q times F, okay? And the same operator acting on G is another eigenvalue times G, okay? So here you'll notice it's the same operator there and it has an infinite set of eigenvalues. Here are two from the infinite set. Q is one of the things in the infinite set. Q prime is another eigenvector, excuse me, eigenvalue in the infinite set, okay? And um, we'll say with Q not equal to Q prime, okay? So these are two of the eigenvalues in the infinite set, Q 
in Q prime, two of the eigenvalues in the spectrum, to use a vocabulary word. Okay. And the eigenvalue Q goes with the eigenfunction F. And the eigenvalue Q prime goes with the eigenfunction G. So for example, if Q is the Hamiltonian for a particle in a box, okay, um, Q, little, little Q might be energy one, Q prime might be energy two, okay? and F might be wave function one, and G would be wave function two. Okay? So these both go with the same operator, which is the, the Hamiltonian operator. Okay, now I want to um, check whether F and G are orthogonal. Okay, so to, to work that out, um, let's think about some inner products. Okay, so one inner product to think about is the inner product of F with operator Q acting on function G. Okay. So this is F inner product with little Q prime times G. Right, because operator Q acting on G is equal to little Q prime times G. And now I can factor out the Q prime from the inner product, same as we did in the proof 15 minutes ago. And so this is uh, Q prime times the inner product of F with G. Okay, but now because Q operator is Hermitian, this uh, is equal to um, the Q operator acting on F inner product with G. Okay, now if I want to simplify that, that is equal to little q times f inner product with g. All right, now I can um, factor little q out from the inner product, right? same as we did 15 minutes ago. Okay. And so that makes a little q complex conjugate times the inner product of F with G. But we know that little q is a, a real number, right? We proved that the eigenvalues are real numbers. So this is equal to just Q by itself, little Q by itself times this inner product. Okay, so um, therefore um, we have seen that uh, little Q times this inner product is equal to Q prime times this inner product. Okay, so if I put both of those things on the same uh, side of the equation, okay, uh, just using the distributive law, that tells us that um, Q, little q minus little q prime times inner product of F with G is equal to zero. 
Okay, so now this goes back to what you learned in high school algebra, right? That if the product of two things is zero, either one is zero or the other is zero. Okay, so this shows us that either um, little q minus little q prime is equal to zero or the inner product of f with g is equal to zero. Okay. But we remember we're assuming that a uh, little q is not equal to little q prime, that these are different eigenvalues, not the same. So um, the difference between those things is not zero. Okay, so therefore, the only possibility that remains is that the inner product of f with g is equal to zero. Um, okay, so, so that statement is, is also analogous. Um, okay, good, good. Um, this is another case where I need to put in a little bit of fine print, like I did at the end of the last class. Okay, the fine print has to do with, um, you know, what happens if there's a degeneracy? That is, what happens if the same number shows up twice? Right, like you remember at the end of the last class, I made a three by three matrix that was like this. Right, and in that three by three matrix, there are three eigenvalues, but two of them are one. One of them is two, right? So one counts twice, okay? So in that situation, in the analogous situation for a Hermitian operator, um, we would call that a, a degeneracy, right? So we'd say if two eigenvalues are degenerate, that is, if the same number shows up on the list more than once, then there, there are many choices. of eigenvectors. And there's a bunch of different ways you could choose to go. But one of the ways that you could choose to go is to keep them orthogonal. OK, so um, we can choose them to be orthogonal. That's kind of the fine print, but I'm not really going to go into that here. That's, that's like a special case. Um, okay. Um, one more kind of general principle to go. Okay. That is, um, we said working with matrices that the eigenvectors, the set of uh, eigenvectors is uh, complete. That is, it is a basis for the vector space. Okay, and you remember I had a nice example of that with um, two different two by two matrices, right? So one two by two matrix had eigenvectors that are like this, okay? These two blue, black vectors, okay? And then another two by two matrix had eigenvectors like this, okay? And then if I had 
any old arbitrary vector like this one, I can express it as a linear combination of the black vectors, or I could express it as a linear combination of the blue vectors, right? And that's just a matter of choice, right? I could do either one, or I can go back and forth between them. Um, so the same thing works for Hilbert space. Um, so this is also true for Hilbert space. That is, um, if we take the um, eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, that is one orthonormal, that's orthogonal and normalized basis for Hilbert space. But we could think about some other operator like momentum. You could say there are going to be a set of eigenfunctions of the momentum operator. And that is a different set of functions and it's another orthonormal basis for Hilbert space. And then I could look at eigenfunctions of position. And that is yet another uh, orthonormal basis for Hilbert space. So choosing these different operators, it's like choosing different uh, two by two matrices, right? And so you know, each two by two matrix gives you um, a set of two vectors, right? Either the two black ones or the two blue ones or some other ones, right? And then um, whatever set of eigenvectors you have, that'll do the job as a basis for the two-dimensional plane, right? Likewise, if you have a three by three matrix, right? That'll give you a set of three orthonormal vectors like this or this or this or some directions. Right? And that will do the job as a basis for three-dimensional space, okay? So now we're taking the dimensionality to be not just two or three, but infinity, okay? But it's okay, it still works. And so um, we can have, um, different um, bases for the infinite dimensional space. And then any arbitrary wave function can be written as the sum of coefficients times Hamiltonian eigenfunctions, or it can be written as the sum of different coefficients times momentum eigenfunctions, or it can be written as the sum of um, yet different coefficients times position eigenfunctions. Um, all right, so let me give you um, a few examples of this because this is kind of an abstract idea in infinite dimensional space. All right, so um, to think about examples, um, well, I'll, I'll start with an example that um, we already know about, which is say for the, the Hamiltonian for uh, a particle in a box. 1D box. So 
um, you remember we solved the time independent Schrodinger equation. Right, which is that H acting on psi is equal to E times psi. Right? And at the time when we did it, uh, I just said, oh, well, here, this is a good trick for solving a differential equation, but now we can recognize this as an eigenvalue relationship. Right? And so, we can say um, we were calculating the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator. Okay? And what we found was a set of solutions with corresponding energies. Okay? So we already found that h acting on psi 1 is equal to e1 psi 1 and h acting on psi 2 is equal to e2 psi 2 and h acting on psi 3 is equal to e3 psi 3 1 2 3 right and dot 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 right on to infinity Okay, so we, we found these things, okay? And um, we found um, what are the energies and what are the sides, right? We found that En is, oops, I didn't write it in my notes. <laughs> now I embarrass myself. Whatever we found, um, what was it? Like N squared, H bar squared, I squared over 2m, something like that. Is that right? I should actually look that up to make sure I'm not telling you wrong. <laughs> Just to show I should have prepared, shouldn't I? Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. We found, we found something like that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, h bar squared, n squared, pi squared over 2m, oh, a squared. That's what I forgot. Okay. Um, lucky this is an open book test. Okay. So, um, and we found the wave functions, right? We found the wave functions, which are that psi n of x is equal to the square root of 2 over a sine n pi x over a like that. Okay, so this means we solved an eigenvalue problem and we didn't even know it. Okay, so that means um, these things, the size, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, etc. These are the eigenvectors or eigen functions or eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, right, of H, okay? And likewise, these energies, En, so that's this one, this one, this one, these are the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, or sometimes people might call them the eigenenergies, because, you know, we stick the prefix eigen on just about anything. Okay, so these are the eigenenergies for the um, particle in a box. Okay, so, um, we, 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 we solved this eigenvalue problem already, okay? And then we also found that the, um, the different eigenfunctions 
are uh, orthogonal to each other, right? So we found that psi n uh, inner product with psi l is delta n l, all right? So that's saying that these wave functions are orthogonal uh, and also normalized, right? So it's an orthonormal set. And we also found that any arbitrary initial condition um, can be written as the sum of these different states, right? And that's using the Fourier series, right? And so we, we wrote the uh, initial condition That is uh, psi of x in time t equals zero is a sum of some cn times psi n of x, like that. Okay, so uh, and now the point of view is that this is like taking any arbitrary vector and expanding it as a sum of the basis vectors, right? So it's like the arbitrary vector that's the red one that I'm writing it as a sum of something times this times something times that, right? So that's the, the geometric interpretation of what we were doing with the solution of the differential equation. Um, all right, so um, that that works great, okay? And so the um, the principle of a Fourier series goes along with the idea that we're working with this orthonormal set of functions. Right? And likewise for the Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator. the Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator, we did the same thing. We did it using a different method, using the raising and lowering operators, but in the end, we got the same kind of solution, right, to the equation the, uh, that the Hamiltonian acting on psi is equal to the energy times psi. And so, we found that H acting on psi zero is E zero psi zero, and H acting on psi one is E one times psi one, and H acting on psi two is E two psi two, dot, 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 right? And the energies came out different in that problem. In that problem, the nth energy is n plus a half h bar omega. So um, those things are the um, eigen energies. That is the eigen values of the new Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator. And likewise, we found the, um, the, the wave function psi n, which I don't even remember, but it was something with exponential functions times Fermi polynomials. Um, and those things are the eigen, functions of H. And those size make a different orthonormal set, which you know, also has these inner products that are delta and L. 
And so once again, with any arbitrary initial condition, um, with any arbitrary initial condition, we could say that psi of x and zero is a sum of a coefficient times the psi n of x, right? And, you know, at the time, I pretended like I was surprised. I pretended like, oh, good luck. These are another set of orthonormal functions. So we get to use the Fourier series trick again, right? Ha ha, I wasn't really so surprised. You suspect it, ready, right? I wasn't really so surprised because I knew this works with any Hermitian operator, right? So it works with the Hamiltonian for any potential energy, right? And so it was not just good luck, but it's, it's always true, right? That we can use the set of solutions to an eigenfunction problem and use that as a basis. And we can express any old function as a sum of coefficients uh, times the functions in that basis. Okay, now, one thing that these two examples have in common is that they both have a discrete set of um, eigenvalues. That is, you can count the eigenvalues on your fingers, right? There's eigenvalue zero, one, two, three, four, right, etc. Okay, um, so these, um, I'll say, these examples have a discrete spectrum that is a discrete set of eigenvalues. Now, you remember, we have also dealt with some problems that have a continuous spectrum, a continuous set of eigenvalues, meaning you can't count them on your fingers, but it's just anything in a certain range of numbers. So we had that with the free particle, and we had that with the um, um, a delta function potential for the, the scattering states. Okay, so let's let's talk about it for the free particle. Okay, that's easier. Okay, so let's say example three would be the free particle, and let's think about the momentum eigenfunctions. Okay, so that means now instead of talking about the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian operator, we could talk about the eigenvalue equation for the momentum operator. That is, we could say P operator acting on psi is equal to some eigenvalue times psi, okay? I was about to write that as a letter P, but there's just too many Ps here. I'll call it lambda times psi, I guess. Mm. I don't know what to call it. 
I don't know what to call it. Um, okay, I'll just call it and type aside. Um, fine. Um, so that means um, negative i h bar d psi dx is equal to lambda psi. All right. That means that d psi dx is uh, lambda over negative i h bar psi. So it is lambda i lambda over h bar times psi. Okay. So um, this is um, a differential equation. It is a first order differential equation that says the first derivative of psi is a constant times psi. Um, you know how to solve things like that, right? The solution is that psi is an exponential function, okay? That is psi is an exponential function uh, a some coefficient times uh, the, the number right here uh, times psi. So uh, I lambda over h bar, not times psi, times x, excuse me. Um, okay. And conventionally in an expression like this, um, physicists like to write that as e to the i k x. Okay. And uh, it's just conventional to put the letter k there. Okay. So from that we say, therefore, uh, lambda is equal to h bar k. All right. So that means we have found the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of momentum. That is the momentum eigenvalues are h bar k. Okay. And the momentum eigenfunctions are any old constant times e to the i k x. Um, so I could call this maybe p sub k, right? The momentum corresponding to k. And I could call this psi sub k of x and K is any real number. So it's continuous. It's anything on the number line. It's not, um, it's not a countable set, right? Momentum one, momentum two, momentum three. Okay. So, um, this is an example of a continuous spectrum. Okay. Now, one thing that I need to point out to you is that the orthogonality, well, the orthonormality, it works slightly differently for a continuous spectrum than it does for a discrete spectrum, okay? So in the case of a, a discrete spectrum, for a discrete spectrum, we would say you know, psi n, 
inner product with psi L is delta NL, right? So it's one if N equals L, zero if N is not equal to L. For a continuous spectrum, um, we, we have to modify that a little bit because um, this, this Kronecker delta symbol is, is designed for integers, right? That are equal to each other or not equal to each other. Um, so we need to um, generalize that here. Okay, and um, I will show you the generalization. Okay, the generalization is to use a Dirac delta function instead of the Kronecker delta symbol. Okay, so the generalization is that we want to take the delta NL and change it to a Kronecker delta of k minus k prime. Okay, so to do this, we can make this work as long as we pick the right value for a. And you know, you could pick any value for a. So I'll tell you what value to pick, okay. Let's choose a is one over the square root of two pi. So we are going to say that psi k of x is equal to one over the square root of two pi e to the i k x. And then for some other psi k prime of x, that is one over the square root of e to the i k prime x. And now what's the inner product of those two guys? So what's the inner product of psi k with psi k prime? Okay. This is going to be an integral from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, I want the complex conjugate of psi k. So that's one over the square root of two pi e to the minus i kx, and then psi k prime. So that's one over the square root of two pi e to the i k prime x dx. So this is one over two pi integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the i k prime minus k times x integrated dx. Now this integral is an integral that I think we've talked about once before this semester. And um, I told you that this integral is equal to um, two pi times delta of k minus k prime, the, the Dirac delta function. And so this is the two pi's cancel, right? And this comes out to be the Dirac delta function of k minus k prime. Um, So this is how the orthogonality works for the case of um, con a continuous spectrum. Right? Um, 
I, I was about to try to prove this statement, but you know, I don't think I want to do that. Um, you can trust me or we can talk about it separately. I don't think I want to go there right now. Okay, so, so this is the, the generalization of the concept of um, orthogonality or orthonormality, all right? And so it means instead of using this Kronecker delta, we're going to use this uh, Dirac delta instead. Okay, now with that generalization, we want to be able to say any old function can be written as a sum of the momentum eigenfunctions, okay? So if we have any old function, the, the initial condition, for example, okay? I wanna say the initial condition can be written as a sum of the momentum eigenfunctions psi k of x. But because it is continuous, not discrete, I can't have a sum over things that I count on my fingers. Instead, the generalization has to be an integral. So that means I'm going to be making an integral over k's of some coefficient that goes here, okay? And um, that coefficient is just what we will call the i of k, right? So this is how we made a wave packet, right? This is um, how, how we made a wave packet. Okay, and then if we want to know what are the coefficients, we take the inner product of both sides with psi k prime, All right? So we would say the inner product psi k prime with the arbitrary initial condition is going to be the inner product of psi k prime with this integral. Dk. So that is the integral of uh, what's, what is it, phi of k times this inner product of psi k prime with, uh, sorry, I'm skipping a step. <laughs> Let me try this again. Inner product uh, with uh, phi k of x. D K. Okay. And this is the integral of phi of K delta K minus K prime D K. And this is phi of K prime. Okay. So there. It works, right? And so uh, we we can get what are these coefficients as an inner product like that, and and so that's just like the discrete case, right? So we've made a, a continuous version of the discrete case, and so this 
you know, encompasses the concept of a Fourier transformation, right? So the nice thing about this kind of abstract concept of the Hilbert space is that, you know, it brings together so many different things that uh, we have talked about so far this semester, right? That they all fit inside the same framework. Um, let's do one more example. I think I have time for it today. Okay, so one more example. Um, what if instead of the momentum eigenfunctions, we want the position eigenfunctions? Is the eigenfunctions of the position operator? Okay, so. Think about the free particle position eigenfunctions. Okay, so that means that the X operator acting on some state, um, let's, let's think of a new name for it x operator acting on some state f is equal to an eigenvalue times f. Um, so this is an interesting equation. It's not a regular differential equation, right? There's no derivative in it, okay? But you know the function x f of x we want that to be, um, I mean, that means just take the function f of x and multiply it by x, okay? We want that to be a constant times the function f of x. How is this possible, right? Because if you have f defined you know, over some range of x and you multiply it by x it means you're multiplying it by a little number when x is little you're multiplying it by a big number when x is big how could that possibly be equal to um, uh, a constant times the function the only way you could possibly make this work is if the function is only non-zero at a single value of x, right? You want a function um, to, to be a spike at a single value of x. We know a function that's a spike at a single value of x, that's this Dirac delta function. Okay, so let's, let's try um, f1 of x to be the Dirac delta function of x minus x1 f2 of x is the Dirac delta function of x minus x2, what, whatever, right? Um, so let's check that. Okay, so um, I, I, I claim that the x operator acting on f1 is equal to x1 times f1. And the x operator acting on f2 is equal to x2 times f2. Um, the proof of that is just to um, use the um, equation for um, a, a delta function. Okay, so um, if I take any test function. So let's um, let's look at the um, inner product 
Uh, how do I do this? The inner product of x f1 with any test function g. So that is the integral of x f1 uh, times g of x dx. That is equal to the integral of x times f1 times g of x dx. I could say f1 star, but this f1, this is a real thing. Okay. That's equal to the integral of x delta of x minus x1 g of x dx. Okay. So we know how to do an integral with a delta function. Uh, and that gives us the, um, the thing that's multiplying the delta function evaluated at x equals x1. All right. So here, the thing that's multiplying delta function inside the integral is x g of x. So that is, uh, the result of that is x1 g of x1. But this is also equal to uh, x1 times the integral of delta x minus x1 g of x dx. Right, this is just working backwards, right? That that the this integral evaluates to be that thing. So this is all equal to x1 times the integral, no, times the inner product of f1 with g. Um okay. So this uh, shows us that the x operator acting on f1, inner product with g, is equal to x1, f1, inner product with g, which is equal to x1, f1, inner product with g. Okay, so if this is true for any g, for any test function g, therefore x f1 equals this x1 f1. Okay. So um, that means we we have um, us we have a set of position eigenfunctions. Of position eigenfunctions which are the f1 of x is equal to delta x minus x1 and the corresponding eigenvalues which are just x1, just all the possible positions. And we can check whether these things are orthonormal. Okay, so we could 
check that the position eigenfunctions are orthonormal. which is, you want to check what is F1 inner product with F2. So that is an integral of delta x minus x1, delta x minus x2 dx. Okay, so this integral is you know, the thing that multiplies the first delta function evaluated at x equals x1. So that is equal to that thing is delta x minus x2. So it's delta x1 minus x2. Okay, so this is our um, delta function uh, orthonormality, right? It's the, it's the version of orthonormality that works for continuous variables, as opposed to the version that works for, um, that works for discrete variables. And the last thing I'll say is um, we can expand any function in position eigenfunctions so if we have any psi of x uh, at time t equals zero we could write that as some integral of a coefficient uh, you know, c of, whoops, C of X1, F of F, uh, let's, let's call it delta of X minus X1 DX. And, you know, this is too easy. We just choose that to be psi of x1, zero. So in this kind of trivially, uh, it's kind of trivially true, right? So um, that is we expand any function Uh, in, in terms of these deltas, in terms of the F1 of X, right? Um, okay, so here, I'm, 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 I'm over time. I gotta stop here. I gotta stop talking. Okay, but the point of this example is for the free particle states, we can work with momentum eigenfunctions or we can work with position eigenfunctions. Either way, and it's like choosing, do we want to work in terms of the black basis vectors or the blue basis vectors, right? These are different sets of basis vectors and we get to choose, right? And so we get to choose position eigenfunctions or momentum eigenfunctions as our basis. Okay. Sorry for running over time. I will stop talking and I will uh, see you guys on Thursday. Thank you.